Today we're finishing off 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And like we've been looking at over the last couple of weeks, this is a section of 1 Corinthians where Paul has been speaking to the church in Corinth, these Christians, these people who belong to Jesus, helping them to understand, hey, don't assimilate into the world. Don't withdraw and disappear from the world. We still, God has sent us as sent ones, as missionaries to wave the banner of the gospel, to put on display His love to the world and certainly to, to declare His Lordship, the salvation that is only found in the name of Jesus. So, so he says, don't withdraw from the world, but also don't become like the world. And as we relate to one another in the church, and when we gather together, for example, like we're gathered today, how do we relate to one another? He's looked at how do we relate to God? He's looked at how do we relate to the world? And now he's helping us understand how do we relate to one another, specifically in the context of when we gather together. So let me read for you the back half of 1 Corinthians 12. This is a, if you've been around Cedar Light for more than a couple of years, you will have likely heard a sermon like today a few times before because this is something that Paul writes to most of the churches. He's like, you know what? And, and because it's in multiple parts of Scripture, he, he wants every church that he's writing to to understand this aspect of how we relate to it. To each other. So if it's in the Bible at all, we know it's very important. If it's repeated in the Bible, we know it's very important. And if Paul goes out of his way to say to everybody he's writing to, you know it's very, very important. So let me read it to you. You can read along uh, in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12 to 31. For just as the body is one and has many parts, and all the parts of that body, though many, are one body, So also is Christ, for we were all baptised by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all given one spirit to drink. So you may think, oh, this sounds a lot like what he was talking about last week, how we have this unity together in the spirit. Yes. Indeed, the body is not one part, but many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body, it is not for that reason any less part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body, it's not for that reason any less part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God has arranged each one of the parts in the body just as he wanted. And if they were all the same part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. Or again, the head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that are weaker are indispensable. And those parts of the body that we consider less honourable, we clothe these with greater honour. And our unrespectable parts are treated with greater respect, which our respectable parts do not need. Indeed, God has put the body together, giving greater honour to the less honourable, so that there would be no division in the body but that the members would have the same concern for each other. So if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honoured, all members rejoice with it. Now you are the body of Christ and individual members of it. And God has appointed these in the church. First apostles, second prophets, third teachers, next miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, leading, various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles... Are all prophets, are all teachers, do all do miracles, do all have gifts of healing, do all speak in tongues, do all interpret, but desire the greater gifts, and I will show you an even better way. So, and, and then he goes on, you might, you might remember, and I will show you an even better way, often read at weddings in the lead into 1 Corinthians 13, again, that famous wedding passage, which isn't really to do with weddings at all. But we'll get there after the creeds. <clears throat> so last week we looked at what is the unity we have in Jesus. Even though we all have different spiritual gifts, we all have unity in Jesus. Week before, we looked at the unity we have in Jesus, that we have various backgrounds, various social circles. We have unity in Jesus. And this week we're looking at we have unity in Jesus. There's a common thread Different contexts, where we go to the table, we have unity. <clears throat> when we are 
uh, relating to one another. We have unity. When we gather together, we have unity. When we come together for our Sunday gatherings, we have unity. He is trying to help us understand we are undergirded by unity. And the banner above us is unity. And so sometimes he'll say, you know what our unity is like? It's like a family where we are beholden to one another, a closer unit than any other social connection. And here he's saying, you know what our, our, our relationship is like? It's like we are a body. And so this week he says, no matter whether you're Jew or Greek, slave or free, he says, we are baptised, or we were baptised, he says, by one spirit <clears throat> into one body. So you were an individual and abstract of the body of Christ, but now you're an individual, a member of the body of Christ. He doesn't take away your individuality, but he adds to it. You're now in the body of Christ, a member of the body of Christ. So when we start to understand this, and we're going to spend about 25 minutes looking at what does this mean for us? When we understand this, when we live this, we obey King Jesus' command to love one another just as he loves us. So when there's no hint of jealousy or envy or divisions or arrogance or superiority, when we don't look down on people because they're, they're of a different ethnicity to us or different social circles to us or different kind of vocation to us or different gifting to us, we don't look down at people. And also conversely, when we don't look up at people and go, well, I can never be like that. Their gift, their social standing, their perceived prestige or whatever it is. When we look up and, and go, well, I can never be like that. Or we look down and say, I'm glad I'm not like that. So these are the divisions that Paul's talking about. We don't have because of the unity we have in the Spirit of God, in our union with Jesus. So rather than looking down on brothers and sisters, rather than dividing over our distinctions, rather than that, he's saying we actually come together in, with our distinctiveness and God weaves us together into a complementary body. It's actually a really wonderful, beautiful picture of the body of Christ. So we are a family <clears throat> and we are the body of Christ. The key verse today, verse 18 as it is, God has arranged each one of the parts in the body just as he wanted. Which is one of the reasons Paul writes there, well, you know, we don't, a hand doesn't say to a foot, oh, I don't need you. Because God has brought us together. And a hand can't look at a foot and say, well, I could never be as good as a foot. No, 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 because God has brought us together. The unity doesn't erase our differences doesn't erase our individuality. God brings individuals together in a complementary fashion to form the body so that we're not all eyes. That would be super gross. I know some, some spiritual beings like around the throne have all eyes. I'm not calling you guys gross if you're listening. Uh, but for us, that would be really, that'd be really gross. But rather, it shows how God has brought our differences together, again, to complement each other, to form a body that works together. When Paul writes to the Ephesian church, it says, so that we would build up the whole body when it works together, builds itself up into love, into Christ, who is the head. So that's the, that's the function of the body is to work together, that each part <clears throat> behaving as it, as it should, like doing what God has brought it to do, would work together for the sake, for the good of the body, for the rest of the body, for the rest of the individual parts to grow up into love, into Christ, who is the head. And so the key verse is, God has arranged it just as He wanted. And our key application is for us to embrace our place in the body of Christ. Our culture doesn't do belonging very well. Uh, maybe a generation ago, Everybody was a member of multiple clubs, you know, sporting clubs and membership clubs and social clubs and like rotary clubs and all kinds of clubs. Uh, club membership in Australia is like an all-time low. We don't like belonging 
to things like we once did. In fact, I'll put it to you, it's one of the key longings of our heart is actually to belong. But our culture is working against one of the things we were made for, which is belonging. So what we tend to do is, we tend to be abstract, atomistic individuals. And we come to communities to receive goods and services from those communities, not to belong to it, but to extract goods and services from those things. And then we come back to our individualistic life. So we come to <clears throat> our work. We want to we'll give what we have to, to extract what we want, to come back to our life. We come to churches to extract religious goods and services. We want teaching or we want to feel good or we need help. Uh, we want good worship or a good kids program or a good something, whatever it is. And then once we get that thing or if we get that thing, we will abstract ourselves from that community again and go about our life. And we only come back to the degree that we are fulfilling our, our perceived needs or our desires. And if not, we will abstract ourselves from that community, go not join to, but extract from another community. And so we have this, this series of abstracted commercial relationships with various bodies. But Paul here, and to all of the churches he writes, he doesn't let us do this as Christians. He, he writes, just as one body, sorry, just as the body is one and has many parts, and all the parts of that body, though many are one body, so also is Christ. And then verse 27, you are the body of Christ. So it helps us understand what is a body? How does a body operate? What does it look like? What does it not look like? And then he says, and that's you guys. That's us. We are that body. So it doesn't say you should be the body of Christ. So try to work hard to become the body of Christ. He says, no, you are the body of Christ. So it's not a question of if you're the body of Christ, but a quality of how healthy is the body? You are the body. That's not the question. Are you or are you not the body? You are. If you're in Christ, you are the body of Christ. So the question is, how healthy is the body? What is the quality of that body? How's the body operating? How healthily are the individual parts that make up the body working together to build itself up into love, into the likeness of Christ? So because we are the body, each one of us has a unique, a distinct role to play. And it's lived out in our everyday lives as we relate to one another, as we relate to God, not just me and God, but we and God. So it's no less you and God. Again, I'm not, trying to, I'm not trying to take away your individuality or your individual relationship with Jesus. Paul doesn't do that. He doesn't take it away. He puts it in its context that we relate to God, yes, as an individual, but also as a body, also as a family. God relates to us together. And then how, we, how do we relate to the world around us? Not just you as an individual, certainly you as an individual, but also we together relate to the world around us because we are the body of Christ. It's an important metaphor. It helps us understand how connected we are. So again, it's not, well, do I, I'm going to decide today, do I want to be a part of the body or um, you know, should I be a part of the body? But rather, we ask ourselves today, okay, now that I know I am a member of the body of Christ, what does that mean for me? I haven't been saved into abstraction. I've been saved into the body of Christ. Plucked out of the kingdom of darkness, out of death and into life, into his kingdom, into his family and into union with Christ himself along with everybody else. We've been brought into union with Christ. That's how we become the body of Christ. We're united in him this is why Paul says it's kind of like the mystery of marriage. It's kind of like the mystery of Christ and the church, two becoming one flesh. And this is the mystery of the union between Christ and his bride, the church. We become united in him. And because we're united to him, not just as an atomistic individual, but as part of the bride. And so we are now part of the body together. 
So this is how different backgrounds, experiences, giftings, personalities, interests, social connections, etc. These are not barriers to our unity. Our culture loves to divide along these lines. Well, you are like me and so I like you. You think the same as me and so we can be in community together. Or you look like me so we can be in community together. And what we tend to do, and especially maybe in the last eight or ten years, uh, when we see lines, we like to keep on our side of the line. And so if we gather together with people who are politically aligned to us, what tends to happen is we draw these lines thicker and deeper to where they become chasms between us and who should be our brothers and sisters or who should be other parts of our body so that we actually become more maybe politically entrenched rather than more built up in love with members of our, our, of our own body. So Paul says, please don't do that. You're the body. Helps us understand the importance of every member. That God has, again, woven this unique body together of each of the members who each bring different backgrounds and ethnicities and even languages, personality types, social circles and networks and giftings and, uh, and proclivities. And he weaves us together for his mission and glory, for our good and for our joy. And so people are not barriers. Like the, the church is not a barrier to us doing what God wants us to do. It is actually the means by which he wants to work in the world. So we don't abstract away from the church to go and do what God's called us to do. We actually say, how has God made us the body? Let's function as the body, build, building up each member into love, into the head who is Christ. And so we don't value people by their utility anymore. We don't value people by what they can do, by how they make us feel, by how easy they are to get along with or how easy their circumstances are in their life, not by their pedigree, where they come from, or their giftedness or their social standing. We don't judge people like that. We don't treat people like that. We don't welcome people according to those things anymore. But rather, when he writes, Paul writes his, not next letter, but the following letter, 2 Corinthians, to the church, he says, we used to view people like this, but we don't anymore. We used to view Jesus like this, but we don't anymore. We want to view people how he, Jesus views people. And so because we have the mind of Christ, we value people because... Jesus values people because he loves them and died for them because we're united with them. Whether you like it or not and whether that is going to change how you live your life or not, and it may, you may need to make some changes to how you live your life, abstracted and dipping in and abstracted and dipping in because we're beholden to one another, because we belong to one another, because we are the body with one another. It changes how we view one another. People have intrinsic value as image bearers because they're valuable to God, they're valuable to us. And we're not abstract of them. We're not abstract, abstracted from each other. We're actually united in the body together. So again, the question is not, are we the body or are we not the body? The question is, how healthy is the body? Different parts of the body keep dismembering from the body and coming back and dismembering and coming back dipping in and out or saying, well, I'm a hand, I don't need a foot, so, you know, screw you, foot, or whatever. Or if that's just how we live our life, even if we never verbalise it like that, the body is incredibly unhealthy. Paul goes on, he says, indeed, the body is not one part, but many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body, it's not for that reason any less part of the body. So again, Paul says, it doesn't matter if you think it's just you and Jesus against the world. He says that, it doesn't make you less part of the body. It just makes you an unhealthy, dismembered foot. And if you're a visual person and you think about a dismembered foot, that is as grotesque as what Paul is trying to help them understand. Because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body. It's not for that reason any less part of the body. 
And just because you, just because you don't want to be a part of the body, doesn't make you not part of the body. If you're united to Christ, you are part of the body of Christ. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, is a key verse. God has arranged each one of the parts of the body just as He wanted. And if all, all parts were the same part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. Or again, the head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. So again, Paul's trying to look at it from both angles. So he can't say, well, I'm, I'm not part of the body because I'm a hand and I don't need the foot. But he's also saying, well, we can't all have hands and no feet. There's no body there. So, so there's a couple of things happening here. He, he's trying to help you understand your value, whether or not you understand your value. That you matter, that you belong. Even if you don't feel like you belong, you do belong. You're, you're a part of us. We belong to one another. We are a part of each other. That's why he goes on to say, man, when, when one part of the body suffers, the whole body grieves with it. Bless you. So we know this from as, as small an incident as stubbing your toe or like, you know, you bump your funny bone and one little part of the body is impacted and the whole body's like, oh, we know that. But, but certainly it can, go, it can get much worse than that where if there's illness or something cancerous in one part of the body, it affects the whole body. We know this. This week we've had people in our, in our family, in our body, uh, who have had family members who have died. And so we grieve with them. People who've had di very difficult weeks this week. And so we grieve with them. We're not abstracted from them. It's not like, oh, well, that sucks for you guys. Bad luck foot, but I'm a hand, so I'm all right. And, and likewise, when we've got people who are celebrating, people who are getting married this week, people who are getting baptized this week, people who've had birthdays this week, people who are celebrating this week, and so we can as a body, we don't say, well, that's great for you, but my life hasn't changed. But rather, because we belong to one another, one part of the body's suffering or grief becomes the whole body's grief. And one part's celebration becomes the whole body's celebration. And because we're in Christ, we can actually hold the tension of doing both of these things at the same time. It also means we can avoid comparison. Not only are you valuable, you're valuable to God. You're valuable in the body. So it, even those parts that seem less honourable, we bestow them more honour, just like we do with our bodies. And those that seem, that need, that seem more honourable or seem more visible, like you know, hands do a lot of work. Face does a lot of work. Mouth does a lot of work. Eyes do a lot of work. Um, but a hand can take a lot more punishment and calluses and, and you know, the... the Parts of the body that maybe have seem to have greater utility, saying they don't get more praise and honor. They're the ones that might get more calloused. Saying there's value for every part of the body. And it means we don't need to compare ourselves to others either. So the hand doesn't say to a foot, eye doesn't say to the ear, one part of the body doesn't say to the other party, well, it seems like you just don't need me. It seems like you just don't need me. Or I don't need you. There's, there's no hint of that in the body. We need each other because we belong to one another because we're a part of one another. So we don't compare ourselves to others and say, well, I can never be like that or thank, thank goodness I'm not like that. We don't say, well, I have no need of you or you have no need of me. No, we need each other. And sometimes what the body needs is your need. So that we can fulfill the law of Christ, Paul writes to the Galatian church, by bearing one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ means that we, we can't be all burden, burden bearers all the time. Sometimes we need your burden so that we can bear that burden and so fulfill the law of Christ. And so what you bring to the body is your need. Not always, but sometimes. Does that make sense? So see the value you have as an image bearer, as part of the body. And avoid comparison. It means that we're not the whole body when we're not 
all gathering regularly. This is not me trying to say you need to be at everything the church does all the time. You know, if you're here every Sunday, you're not a good Christian. I'm not trying to say that at all. What I'm trying to say is being a part of the body is the regular rhythm of someone who belongs to Jesus because we do belong to one another. We sh- because we are the body, we shouldn't live lives abstracted from the rest of the body. Because we're the body, we shouldn't be dismembered thumbs, legs, arms, eyes, ears, etc. Does that make sense? doesn't mean be at everything, otherwise, you know, we're not, we're not the whole body, we're not all together, so everyone needs to be at everything all the time. Again, I'm not trying to get legalistic and say those kinds of things. What I'm trying to say is it should be the regu- a part of the regular rhythm of your life. This is why when we have discipleship groups, our discipleship groups are not a Bible study that meets on a Wednesday evening for two hours, for example, but rather it is a group of people who we belong to for discipleship, who meet together on a weeknight and meet together on Sundays and meet together on other parts, you know, in other times of the week or call each other or message each other or connect online together. That's a, that's a group for discipleship. And our church is made up of many, many groups for discipleship who then all come together and meet together on Sundays or uh, for feeding people for food pantry or going down to Victor Harbour for green team mission or whatever it is. So it's not the event that matters. It's the belonging to one another that matters. The event is one kind of visualisation representation of that. And the writer of Hebrews and, and God does say, we don't want to neglect meeting together. We do want to meet together. We do want to be a regular part of our life and discipleship and because we are the body of Christ. But the point is not the Sunday gathering. This is an expression of the body coming together. So again, a hand that goes off on its life as just a hand and not part of the body, single-handedly, if you like, that hand will be ineffective versus the hand as part of the body. Because the hand's role is not just to go and do what a hand does, hands do, but actually to be a part of the body, to build up the body in love into Christ, who is the head. Do you understand what I mean? The function of the hand is not just to be, you know, five, five digits gripping things or, you know, an opposable thumb so we can do stuff or, or writing, but actually it's part of the body. It builds up the body. So if each part of the body lived an abstract existence, just came together when it wanted something or needed something and went back to its abstracted life, that'd be some like Picasso, weird disgusting sort of body. But that's, the, that's how many in the body of Christ live. It's not what we're made for. It doesn't work for us. You can't find that kind of community by dipping in and dipping out and trying to find it until you, until you get it. That kind of community can't be found. It can only be built as we operate together as the body of Christ. Each member individually, but one body working together. I hope this is making sense. So in verse 27, it says, now you are the body of Christ. Individually members of it, so again, your individual, your identity doesn't disappear, but it's put into its proper context in the community of Christ, in the family of Jesus, in the body of Christ. And and then he goes on and says, you know, there are various roles like apostles, prophets, teachers, those who perform miracles, um, and so on. He says we don't all have the same role. He's he's circling back to where we started this thought last week we looked at in the beginning of the chapter about spiritual gifts. He says there are different kinds of spiritual gifts, different members of the body, but the point is that they're all given for the church. It's what he writes in the Ephesian church, chapter 4, he says, God gave the apostles and prophets and evangelists and teachers and shepherds similar kind of list for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body. It's a similar, you know, maybe parallel passages here where, uh, to what he's writing to the church in Ephesus. Saying the, these kinds of gifts are given, these people are given gifts for the building up of the body for the equipping of each person for the ministry. 
So that it's not like the apostles and prophets and teachers are the ones who are doing ministry. It's not like in this context where I'm here teaching and preaching, where I'm doing ministry and you are receiving a religious service from me and then you go about your life having been pumped up a little bit by a religious service and, and we'll go and have some religious goods and then we'll go about our lives. But rather that in this context, I am a, I am gifted to present my gift to you so that you would be built up so that you can go and do the ministry, the work of the ministry. You are the saints equipped for the ministry. The ministry is building up one another in love into the head who is Christ. So not only do we abstract ourselves from community, we abstract Scripture from its context, I'm going to realise that those Ephesians 4 ministries are for the building up of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body. That's who we are. We are the body of Christ. You are a member of the body of Christ. You are an important and valuable member of the body of Christ. We, even if you're, if you're a pinky toe, if we lose our pinky toe, it's a big deal. We can still walk, but we're, we're missing our toe. Each member has an important and valuable part to play in the building up of the body, to be discipled, but also to make disciples, to receive gifts and to be a gift giver. So what are we to do? We need to take stock of our life, actually. And think to ourselves, have I been living as an, just as an individual? So you are, again, you are an individual. God does relate to you individually, but not only individually. Have you only been experiencing the love of God as an individual? Or have you been a dismembered, abstracted part of the body? And then what does it look like to live as part of the body? to actually belong in the body, to be beholden to somebody else. We looked at this a couple of weeks ago as God weaving our lives into one another, that we'll be built up in love and building each other up in love. What does it look like to not look down on people because they're different to us or think differently to us and not, ask in our own minds, be looked down on or, or consider ourselves less than somebody else who has a different kind of gifting or is a different part of the body, but rather say, oh, actually, how do I embrace who God has made me in the body? And he does say, he finishes his thought with, I mean, eagerly desire the greater gifts. If you want to have a bigger impact in the body, ask God for a bigger impact in the body. Embrace your calling and remember that we are the body of Christ, each with a part to play. When we come together in unity, the diversity among us is not cause for division, but rather celebration of how God has brought individuals together, carefully, uniquely woven us together in the bonds of love, in the banner of the gospel, in our union with Jesus. When we sing together, we're singing together as one body. So you might think, oh, I'm a great singer, I'm a terrible singer, but we sing together as a body. Or when we go out and we, we serve together, you might think, well, I'm, I've, I'm really good at serving or I'm really not good at serving, but it's when we serve together is why we need each other. Because we, we together have an impact. All right, let, me, let me pray for us. Then we're going to gather around the table I'm going to worship our King again together. And if you've never thought about what does it mean to even just one application of this in our singing together, let's think about how our voices make harmonies together, how we're not a distraction to those around us. We are together in a choir. So when we're up here singing and playing, you are not an audience and we are not performing 
but we together as the body of Christ, some gifts are being used up here, some gifts are being used over here, some gifts are being used over here. They may have a varying degree of giftedness when it comes to music. But what does God want from us? He wants our worship, he wants our love, he wants our heart. And he is here among us by his spirit, the same spirit we just talked about today that has united us. It's the one spirit we have union in. And so when we lift up our voices in the power of the Holy Spirit, we worship him as one, and it is beautiful to the Father who loves us. So please, can we, that's one application. Let's look for all the other applications of, um, of how we live as a healthy body of Christ. Let's pray together. So Father, I want to thank you again for weaving us together, for bringing us each other, for acting upon us in love, Thank you for the wonderful diversity we have in the body of ethnicity and backgrounds, birthplaces, languages, ideas, but unity in the spirit, unity in the gospel, unity in who we are in Jesus, unity in our union with Christ, unity in our baptism, Union in our common union around the table. And so, Father, we praise you for making us the body and help us to be a healthy body. Each part working together to build up the body into love, to the very likeness of Jesus who is our head. Help us to lay down those things that abstract us from the body even things that we like or our comfort or ease so we can embrace who you have made us in the body. For they help us to eagerly desire those greater gifts and greater impact to be more life bringing, more spirit filled, more joy bringing, to have more effect in building each other up and in every way help us to bring you glory in Jesus' name.